Manami West Side, uh, Manami West Side, Los Angeles. I've been involved in helping families. I'm a licensed clinician. I help families learn to cope and deal with having a mentally ill relative with a mental health condition, and which can create incredible chaos, confusion, devastation, despair, uh, uh, heartbreak, and uh, anger, and guilt, and shame, and also utter grief. So uh, that has been my profession for the last 30 years. And uh, I have been president of NAMI on and off for many years, primarily because I can't get anyone else to take the job on. So I just want to introduce you to three NAMI people before we introduce you, John. And this is Aaron Raftery, our executive director. And Aaron, could you just tell us about Pure Edge, which you promoted today? I think John will be very interested in this. And then we'll have you talk just a little bit about what you do, Jim, and then we'll go ahead. Yes, Aaron. Certainly, John, I'm happy to share. Um, and uh, it's a, actually a very creative project, which I think you would appreciate. Um, we are, um, we have a fiscal sponsor by the name of Pure Edge, and they're a social emotional learning organization that focuses on um, trying to prevent burnout for um, educators like yourself and students. Um, and so we are doing an anti-stigma campaign for mental health and we've photographed over 100 ambassadors with black and white photography and a very impactful image. Um, all of these um, people of note are using their voice, literally, um, and they're captured in a silent scream in this black and white image. And so they're raising their voice um, for mental health. So uh, this campaign will launch on October 10th, World Mental Health Day, so this Sunday. And so it, it will um, effectively launch on all social media platforms. So on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, things like that, um, Twitter, and they will share their image and they will also share their personal mental health journey, um, really to try to fight the stigma that's surrounding mental health and create awareness. Um, one of the overall goals of the campaign is to kind of shift the conversation and incorporate uh, mental Schools. There's a bill that's on the governor's death, a desk called SB 224, and hopefully, fingers crossed, that it will get signed this Sunday. Um, but that was co-sponsored by a local senator, Senator Anthony Portatino, and co-sponsored by NAMI California, which would mandate mental health education um, for children, and it would be age-appropriate education from the age of kindergarten through 12th grade. So really kind of shifting that conversation, having those um, young minds really have a healthy me. Um, and so we kind of um, start treating mental health just as important as physical health. Um, and it's a great segue because the campaign really promotes our educational programs, bringing in that prevention and early intervention into schools um, through our Ending the Silence program and NAMI on campus. So it's a great way to introduce my colleague, Tim Davis. Thank you, Aaron. We're so excited about Pure Edge. We're so excited. And it's really, really an exciting campaign. Um, I am really excited to hear from our speaker tonight and who's been very patient with us. So I do have some programming announcements I'd love to make, but I will make them um, after John's presentation. But uh, John, I think we're ready to hear from you if you're well, ready to- Let me just say know. something about Cynthia. Cynthia runs our support groups and runs uh, our campaign our telephone campaign called Cal Hope, where you, we have 10 counselors you can call in any time of day or night if you're in a mental health crisis. So thank you, Cynthia. And this is Garrett Shaw, who's run our support groups and does a lot of public speaking for NAMI because he himself suffers with schizophrenia and has recovered and talks a lot about that. So I just want to introduce the NAMI people and I'm going to turn the meeting and I too can hardly wait for your talk, John. Sounds very interesting. This is John uh, uh, title, Titleman? Uh, Tatelman. Tatelman, Tatelman. And, and with the beard and the hat, you fit right in. <laughs> fit right in. So I'm turning the meeting over to you, John. And would you please introduce yourself, please? Yes. Please. Yes, absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, John Tatelman. I am a licensed uh, marriage and family therapist working in Los Angeles. Um, 
currently I have a private practice uh, in Northeast LA in Highland Park. Um, I also am adjunct faculty at Antioch University, Los Angeles, where I teach narrative therapy in practice in the uh, master's program. And um, I also teach human sexuality there. Um, in addition, I've worked, uh, I have a really rich experience working in um, uh, rehab treatment centers, both inpatient and outpatient. I've been a group facilitator for the past eight years in various groups. Uh, right now I'm leading a group through the, uh, a musician's union called Yuma, where I'm working with uh, artists struggling with long haul COVID symptoms. Um, so that being said, I'm also a musician and an artist, which uh, is a whole nother part of my life. And I'm continually curious about the ways in which my identity as an artist and my identity as a therapist reciprocate each other. Um, and uh, that is a lot about what I'm gonna be talking to you today, which is the use of photographs uh, within a mental health context, both on an individual uh, group and community level. Um, uh, I am a narrative therapist um, and so, um, I'm not so sure about how many of you are familiar with narrative therapy, but I'm going to begin today by grounding us uh, within some of the values that I hold as a both a narrative therapist and a human being uh, on this planet. And so I'm going to share my screen. Um, I'm going to share uh, and um, something I wanted to add is that all these uh, documents that I share today uh, can be available to you as well. I can email them to you if you're interested after uh, the presentation today. Um, at the end, I'll drop my email in the chat. And if anyone's interested, feel free to email me and keep in touch. So let me open up where we're going to start this evening. Great. Can everyone see this OK? Mm -hmm. Awesome. So let's go over some of the tenets that I hold as a narrative postmodern therapist. Uh, narrative therapy, started by David Epstein and Michael White, up here is a great quote from David Epstein. Every time we ask a question, we are generating a possible version of a life. So narrative therapy is big on questions. Uh, I like to say that I am continuously trying to ask questions of my clients that point to where the buses don't run in their brain. So for me, it's about asking very generative questions. The best thing that I can hear as a therapist is, oh, I've never thought of that before, or that is a really good question. I love hearing that from my clients. All right, so tenant number one, the person is not the problem. The problem is the problem. Externalizing language separates the person from the problem, thereby allowing space to more clearly examine the effects of the problem and to assist in identifying preferences that stand outside of the problem story. A person struggling with the effects of depression versus a depressed person. So language is very important to me as a narrative therapist. Language not only can uh, describes reality, but it constructs it. And so for me, there's a big shift in using the type of language that views people as having a relationship with depression versus as a depressed person. Um, I like to stay away from totalizing language so that we can open up space for other possibilities. Number two, shoulds tend to support problem stories. We invite clients to evaluate the usefulness of cultural messages, values, and rules of engagement, shoulds, that often stand in the way of their preferred experiences. We're much more interested in the client's values than in the values imposed from outside. Replacing I should with I need or I want often helps facilitate this process. So as a narrative therapist, I am listening for people's intentions, people's commitments, people's values, what matters to them, and people's agency. 
in what way are they engaging with these things and enacting these things in their lives? Um, and so I'm continuously curious about in what ways people are uh, being held back from standing in their value systems. Number three, there are exceptions to every problem story. By eliciting exceptions to the problem and working on encouraging the exceptions to occur more often, the therapist helps the client develop control over what has often seemed to be an insurmountable problem. The more exceptions grow, the more problems diminish. It's physics. Exceptions interest me more than rules. So uh, we're gonna talk about this more as we start to look uh, at photographs within the context of conversations and mental health and how we might tease out exception stories, stories that aren't as uh, storied and aren't as um, present as the ones that tend to bring people into therapy. Number four, the client is the expert. Postmodern therapy does not engage normative models of mental health. We join clients in drawing forth from them preferred solutions that come from their own meaning, language, and experience. Our interest lies in client resilience rather than dysfunction. We take a decentered but influential position in the work, never presuming to be the authority on someone else's lived experience. One of the values I hold as a therapist is that people are the expert of their own lives. Um, I see clients 50 minutes out of their week. And from my perspective as where I stand and when I went to school is that I think that, um, that I am not in the position to be able to know the entirety of someone's life in those 50 minutes. Uh, so I honor their local knowledge and their local resourcefulness. Uh, all therapy, number five, all therapy is political. Systems of power exist throughout the entirety of our culture, including the therapy room. We invite clients to identify operations of power and their oppressive elements, challenging the taken for granted assumptions, quote, that's just the way things are, that tend to keep marginalizing practices in place. Think sexism, racism, heterosexism, ableism, the inherent hierarchical structure of the therapy room, not evaluating systems of power and the resulting effects on our clients, maintain systemic oppression, and is therefore a political act. I think this is an extremely important part of narrative therapy for me, is that we are, we are consistently uh, engaging with in which ways power systems uh, have an effect with, within our clients' lives. Six, clients are always cooperating. Clients are always telling us how they think change occurs in the pace at which they are comfortable going. Flexibility allows us to discover how people think and how they act upon their problems. While we remain mindful of additional potential possibilities for change, we privilege clients' choices for their own lives. There are no classically resistant clients, only inflexible therapists. Seven, client language matters. Language does more than merely describe reality. The language we use as therapists and clients creates, constructs, and constructs our realities. I kind of went over that one already. Eight. Focusing on the positive future facilitates change in the desired direction. A client recently used a driving metaphor to describe our work together in therapy. It makes so much more sense to be looking ahead at the road while I'm driving the car rather than continually looking in the rear view mirror. Um, narrative therapy, while some more classical forms of therapy lead with going into the past, uh, Narrative therapy is concerned with the past as it pertains to the present for clients. I'm definitely interested and, and willing to go into the past um, if my clients are interested in that, but I don't lead with that. Um, let's see, change is occurring all the time. Our task is to help the client select and identify those meanings, those changes and those ways of becoming that they like and would like to see more of. 
The fact that change is always occurring points in the direction of the possible future. People are multi-storied and we make ourselves up every day as we go along. Number 10, small changes lead to larger change. While respecting the strength of problem stories that accompany clients into therapy, incremental steps are co-constructed by the client and therapist in order to facilitate change in the client's desired directions. Small changes lead to larger change. And that leads to number 11, which is there's no such thing as too small of a goal or exception. What's going a little bit well that you like to see more of? How did you manage to do that? What's your hope for what our conversations will be able to provide? All of these questions point in the direction of that change is occurring at all times. And there's no thing as such as too small of a goal. Number 12, huge one. People are inherently resourceful. Milton Erickson was once asked if he felt it's true that everyone has all the resources they need to solve their problems. He replied, I don't know if it's true or not. What I do know is that I get farther with people if I believe it. Very powerful statement. Meaning is constructed through experience. There is no correct or absolute meaning, only subjective meaning based on the individual's interactions and the meanings attached to those experiences. Meaning is relative to the person experiencing the event. And as a narrative therapist, I'm always curious about the meaning making that people are constructing with the lives that they're living. Again, tying that back to values and commitments. 14, the answers lie in the specifics. A client who identifies, uh, quote, a beginner's class at Yoga Works in Larchmont Village this Saturday at 10 a.m. before brunch is more likely to engage than a client who might try some yoga. So this comes from uh, a client, you know, that I was working with. And at the end of session, I always like to ask, you know, what, what about our conversation today would you like to carry with you into the next week? And really getting into the details of what they might be trying on in this next week. Where do they imagine that might be helpful? Um, and getting those details. 15, we prefer the lens of feedback rather than failure. As therapists, we share responsibility for our part in the co-constructing of client goals. A client's lack of follow through is important feedback. Perhaps the goal was too big of a step rather than a failure. Again, so if a client goes out and they say, you know, I'm going to go to yoga uh, four times this week and these are the times I'm gonna go and they come back and they come to session and they say, you know what? I didn't go to yoga. I didn't, I didn't do what I said I was going to do. I take full responsibility in the co-constructing of that goal. And perhaps it was too big of a step for that client. And maybe we could take a smaller step towards that goal together. Um, great. So I'm going to stop sharing this screen now. Um, and we are, uh, yeah, let me look at the time. Okay, great. So uh, those are some of the underlying assumptions of postmodern and narrative work. And now I'm going to talk about ways in which um, these ideas get teased out and facilitated through photographs. Um, and so not, not to make therapy really simple, but I, I view, um, when people come in into my office, I, I, I think about, you know, what are their dreams? What are the things getting in the way for them? And what are the things that are supporting them in getting towards their dreams? And I'm listening for all of these pieces and really trying to ask tiny questions that tether back to these goals of intentions, commitments, values, and agency. So I'm trying to amplify and grow agency through generative questioning. Um, and so one way, so in terms of photograph work, I just wanna talk a little bit about how this came about for me uh, within my hours as a trainee. 
um, which uh, was some years back. I worked at a high school in Woodland Hills and I was working at a, a continuation high school. I don't know how many of you are familiar with what a continuation high school is. I wasn't, so I'm gonna tell you really quickly. A continuation high school is a part of the high school where uh, the kids who are labeled trouble or they're labeled uh, learning. Uh, disabled. What's that? Learning disabled. Yeah, learning disabled. They are put in a separate part of the building um, and they essentially have a, a, a different learning system. Um, and I was brought in there as a therapist um, I was very green as a therapist. I was very new. I was very nervous. And uh, I would sit with, I was doing a group in both individual work. And in the context of that, I would sit down and uh, one of the students would meet with me and they would pull out their phone and they'd be like, check out this, check out what I did this weekend. Look at these photos. And I'd be like, Oh wow, that's that's really amazing. And I'd say, okay, like let's put let's put the phone away and like let's get to the real therapy, uh, the therapy thing. And then I realized after a few times, I was like, wait a second, these kids are showing me what is meaningful to them on their phones. They're showing me these photographs of these rich stories of meaning. And so I began to think about in what ways can I engage with the, these photographs and which, in what ways can I bring these forth within a therapeutic context? And so I started doing a lot of writing on this and I, um, I uh, basically uh, pitched a workshop to Antioch um, called Narrative Phototherapy. And this is sort of some of the stuff I'm going to be talking to you about today. I'm condensing a Five, or sorry, condensing a seven hour workshop into the next uh, half hour or 20 minutes. So I just want to say that this is sort of a very introductory way to the way I work. And I'm going to try and give you all some, some tools and some questions that I have found helpful in my use of photographs. So um, they say that when there is a house fire, uh, people, the first thing they grab is photographs, right? They hold rich stories of meaning for, for people. And um, in the technological age that we live in now, it seems very, very valuable that people are carrying around rich stories of meaning within their pockets at all, all moments, right? So we have this opportunity these days that a lot of the clients we, we, that I work with uh, tend to have photographs of meaning within their pockets, right? And I want to find ways of eliciting those within the context of therapeutic conversations, again, tethering back to these narrative tenets, right? Of value systems, of commitments, and of agency. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm going to, uh, let's see, where should I begin? I'm going to talk about... Um, ways in which I have done this to various degrees. I am, give me one moment here to pull up my next, okay. So yeah, so I've always been drawn to stories and the, and the power of sharing stories. And every time we share a story, every time we talk about a photograph, we're at a different point in time, right? So it's an opportunity in, to take up different invitations for different perspectives. Um, so uh, for me, I'm, I'm remaining curious to photographs and the multiplicity of story and narratives that they hold. Um, and so, uh, I'm also, again, to, to, to kind of refer back to the tenants that we talked about earlier, I'm interested in these subordinate storylines, the lived experience that is less often told that gets buried under the dominant storyline, right? And um, to kind of uh, elicit a little bit of a metaphor here, um, I'm going to play a quick video um, and I'm hoping, uh, give me one minute, I'm going to pull it up. And if you have seen this before, uh, 
just kind of keep it to yourself. But I'm going to play this quick video. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and see if this works out. Great. Here we go. All right. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Great. So that be how many of you did anyone see the moonwalking bear? Raise your hand. No, no one don't that. believe that. Was that moonwalking bear the first time through? Yeah, I, I that's so hard to believe. That's incredible. That's yeah. Amazing. So this is the metaphor that I like to use when I teach uh, narrative therapy and when I teach the use of photographs is that there's all these problem stories that can get in the way of those sparkling moments, right? those less often told stories, those ones of rich resourcefulness, those ones that stand outside of the dominant narrative of depression or anxiety for people. And I'm really interested in eliciting those and amplifying those instances, right? So for example, I was working with an older woman who struggled with severe depression and had really, been telling me that at no point in her life had she ever experienced joy or happiness, right? And I really, this is, I, I was really curious about this. And so um, the way I work with photographs is again, I'm taking a very postmodern stance is I invite people to bring them in. I don't lead with them. I'm not like, you know, please bring in photographs next week. I, I explain sort of my process and I say, you know, I'm wondering if you, you, you'd be interested in bringing in some photographs next week. I, I work with photographs and clients quite frequently and I'm wondering if that'd be something you're interested in. And so she brought in a photograph, she brought in these photographs and a couple of them are of her as a child. And one of them was uh, her dancing at a, uh, a sibling's wedding. And, and I was really curious about this. And, you know, we talked a lot about it. And again, the answers are in the details, right? So I'm asking about a lot of details. I'm eliciting these details of this wedding and what the experience was like and where, what this was like. And then at the end, I'm, I'm you know, curious. I'm saying, you know, uh, you've told me that you have never experienced any, any joy in your life before. And I'm kind of curious about this photograph. Um, and this, and, and, you know, this time in your life. And for her, again, that wasn't to dismiss and not honor the very intense, uh, profound effects of depression. But for her, that was an extremely opening moment, an opening moment of, of realizing that perhaps depression hasn't had the strong grip that it's always had in her life. And I'm always or I'm, I'm continuously curious about the words always and never as a narrative therapist. I'm, I'm really, I'm really like to bring on what I like call a gentle relentlessness when it comes to that languaging. Um, and so one thing I want to uh, leave with you all as, as we do this workshop is ways in which I engage with questions around photographs. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is uh, what I like to call time traveling questions. Let me pull this up. We'll share the screen. Do, do, do. Is this it? Yep. Great. Okay. So time traveling questions. I like to play with the fluidity of time. And photographs are a great way of doing that. They are a snapshot of time being viewed um, from the present. So um, these are some questions that I, again, you will all have your own questions as you begin to maybe try this on if you're interested in it. But here are some that I've 
tried on over time, which is, uh, I'll just go through these. Is there anything that you are noticing that is different since the last time you looked at the photograph? What is the effect of the shift on you? So again, this points to the idea that things are always changing, right? Uh, a central tenet of narrative therapy. What is the effect of this shift on you since the last time you looked at this photograph? What, if anything, are you appreciating about the photograph at this point of time that you would like to carry with you into the future, right? So what is it about this photograph that elicits some sort of meaning making for you that you would like to carry with you as you leave the room today, as you leave towards these future dreams and goals? What do you imagine yourself in the photograph might say to your ability to stand up to depression today? So again, this is a creative kind of playful way of inviting the perspective of the person in the photograph versus the person who's sitting in the room, right? Allowing the person to step into that imaginary space of adopting the perspective that maybe they once had that was in the photograph. Uh, what was with you in this photograph that you would hope to have more of in your life today? Again, teasing forward some of the values and commitments that people hold. If you were to look at this photograph in the future, what from our conversation would you hope to remember? So again, this leads with the idea that within the context of talking about this photograph, that change is also occurring and that it serves as a document to return to later on in their life, right? So if they were to pull this photograph out again, what would they hope to remember from the conversation? If the present you could pass any knowledge to the past you, what might you say? Again, kind of bringing forth any sort of resourcefulness that people have learned in their lives that they would wanna pass on to the past version of their self. Um, if I were a fly in the wall when this photograph was taken, what would I be feeling in the room? What sorts of feelings exist within the context of this photograph? How do you imagine the discussion of the photograph having an effect on the current problem that we're working on in the context of therapy? How do you know when something is meaningful to you? And what do you imagine the photograph, or what, what uh, do you imagine the effect of the photograph to have on me? So these are examples of kind of time traveling questions, playing with time, playing with perspective and honoring the idea that change is happening all the time. Let's go down here to remembering questions. So this is kind of a, um, a little play on words here. So uh, not only are we remembering, but we are remembering, we are reconnecting. So uh, these would be the types of questions that I would ask if there were other members within the photograph, right? Such as a family photograph or a photograph of someone with their pet or uh, moments where there are other items in the room, other, they don't necessarily have to be alive either. Um, so examples might be, uh, what do you imagine your father might say in your ability to take a stand against the forces of shame? So inviting the perspective of someone's father or loved one. Uh, what do you think your grandma might appreciate about you sharing this photograph? Who would not be surprised that this photograph is meaningful to you? Who else knows about your value systems? Who are your systems of support? If your dog could speak, what do you think he would say he appreciates about you? Uh, that can be kind of the type of question that could either land or not land with a client. And I am always giving my clients permission to tell me if something is not a good fit for them. Um, oh, sorry. Yes, I will make the font bigger. Give me one second. Whoop, is that, that's bet. Oh gosh, that's better. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, like I was saying, um, I ask a lot of questions of my clients and I lead with telling them from the very beginning that if something is not a good fit for them, that please give me the permission to uh, reel it back. Here's one about nature, right? What do you appreciate about the tree's ability to stand its ground? 
Uh, people often bring in photographs, not just of people and themselves, but of, of nature, of natural surroundings, of mountains. And that is a rich place for metaphor. What, what do you imagine uh, this person, this you might say about your decision to stand up to insecurity? So again, inviting the perspective of themselves in the past. Um, if the photograph could speak, what might it say? So giving some, uh, yeah, some voice to the photograph. Um, and that can be extremely important. So I wanna also kind of finish up this portion with talking about photographs as documentation, which is, I think is extremely important. In the digital age, we've become keeping, or we have keep most of our photographs on our phone. But I think it's really important after we have these rich conversations with people to find places where photographs can serve as reminders of these conversations of healing and change. So asking, you know, when people bring in these photographs, where's this photograph kept? Where's its home? A lot of times people will tell me, oh, well, this photograph's actually been in a shoebox under my bed. Or uh, yeah, I don't, I don't keep this one out. But after the conversation, well, it, it might be important, right? To serve as a reminder, would you wanna keep that in your bathroom mirror to serve as a reminder of what we might talk about today? Where is its home? If a photograph were to exist in an album or a collection, what might you title it? So bringing some sort of naming to the change that people are, uh, are trying to make in their lives and using that as a touchstone to return to. Um, what's it like to know you carry these photographs of blank in your pocket, right? What's it like to know you carry these photographs of meaningfulness or of happiness in your pocket at all times? What would be the first inclination that calling upon and looking at this photograph might be helpful, right? So imagining that perhaps, well, I'm starting to feel those feelings of anxiety coming on. Would it be helpful for me to take out my phone and look at this photograph that reminds me of that inherent resourcefulness that I hold in standing up to the dominant story? Um, do you imagine looking at this photograph more often to have an effect on the face of the problem? Uh, where do you imagine you might keep it in your home to serve as a reminder of what we talked about today? And who, if anyone, would you make a copy of this photograph for to hold this new narrative with you? So forming a sense of community. Great. And again, these are all accessible to you if you would like me to email them um, at the end. Um, let's see. I know I talked a lot and I want to leave some time for questions. Uh, so I'm curious, uh, yeah, I, I want to leave any time for any questions that you might have um, that I can be helpful with. Could you suggest some more metaphors as using nature as metaphor? Hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I That's think- a great idea. I think for me, um, as a therapist in general, I'm very steeped in metaphor. Um, and I think that, that that's partially because I'm a narrative therapist and partially because I'm uh, an artist. Um, but I'm always curious about metaphor, right? So I think just beyond nature, right? So someone who I know is really into baseball, right? Or someone I know who is really into cars, right? I, or let's just go with baseball for a second. I like to know like, okay, like who's on your team of support, right? Like, let's talk about your life a little bit. Like who, who in your life uh, represents like your coach? Like who, who holds values that you would want more of in your own life, right? I'll even put it out on my whiteboard here in the office. I'll draw, I've done this before, client draw a baseball diamond, right? Let's talk about like, who do you depend on most in your life to support these things? Uh, beyond that, right, like in terms of nature, um, I've talked about mountains with clients, right? Like mountains hold so many different uh, stories 
and experiences over time? How do they uh, experience different type of weather patterns and hold their ground? Um, but I think the main thing that I would say is that I don't really have a prescriptive way of working with language and metaphors. I'm just genuinely curious and interested about what people love in their life and using that as facilitation of language to talk about the problems and the dreams that they want to inhabit and step more into. Whether it's music, uh, right now I'm working with a 18 year old musician who's really into guitar, really into effects pedals, and they struggle with uh, uh, a relationship to anxiety. And we talk about how, you know, anxiety is like a, a feedback noise for them, right? And like how, playing with the language around uh, music and um, yeah, and, and therapy. And so I'm really always curious about language and staying, like I kind of said in the beginning of this presentation, staying really experienced near to the language that they use to describe their problems, right? What they might call feedback or noise, right? So, uh, another clinician might come in and say, okay, that's anxiety, right? But I'm actually not as interested in the clinical language as I am the language of my clients because I feel like it creates a stronger sense of change. Um, in my experience, uh, that's been the case. Garrett. Um, thank you for this presentation. I'd love to learn more about how, how when you said in the beginning, the person is not the problem, the problem is the problem. Can you explain that a little bit more? Absolutely. So thank you. Uh, from a postmodern perspective, the problem is not located within the person. The problem is located outside of the person. And that is because it helps to have clients take a evaluative look and take a step outside of the problem and view it from an outside perspective, right? So for example, I might, and this isn't something I require of my clients because again, like I said, problems can have very, very uh, invasive effects, right? Um, I would never say that you know, you don't have, you don't have depression to my client. But what I would lead with is the idea that they are experiencing depression. They have a relationship with depression. That's a very different stance than saying you are a depressed person, which is kind of a totalizing language that leaves not as much space for other possibilities, right? And so I try to stay away from more of a pathologizing language. The way that I use diagnoses is very collaborative. I look at the DSM with my clients. I open up the DSM with my clients. I go through and read it together. I say, do you feel like this fits for you? Um, do you feel like this is something that you identify with? Again, I allow them to make the evaluation and be the expert of their own lives. But it's really important because, just to get back to what you're asking, Garrett, problems also come from a very, a lot of times, a very systemic context of power relations and oppression. And I feel as though narrative therapy and postmodern therapies do a really good job of acknowledging that, the systemic issues and the environmental issues that people face. So for me, like things like depression and anxiety, I feel like are a completely normal uh, response to the world we're living in. Like I, I feel as though mental illness is a complete normal response to the world we're living in. A uh, drug addiction, um, alcoholism, for me, is really needs to be viewed at, through a systemic lens uh, as well as a individual one. And so I think that that is also really important in the languaging of uh, the person is not the problem. The problem is the problem. It views the problem as separate from the person. Yeah. I hope that was helpful. Uh, Tim. Yeah. Um, well, John, really, w w one thing that really resonated for me in your talk is how you are really activating your clients to be, to take a real active role in their own recovery through creating story or finding meaning. And I was, there was kind of, there was some, a lot of interesting prompts on that last 
um, slide that I asked you to bump up because I couldn't, I mean, I, I wasn't able to read it. The, there was one where you were saying like, who in your life would you share this photograph with? Yeah. And when I was reading it, it sounded like it was almost an accountability thing, but it didn't sound, but actually I don't think that's what you meant by it. Like you're looking for someone like who they trust or who they can take into their confidence or who like is on their team. Like, the, yeah. like identifying what was, I, I guess I was asking what was really behind that prompt. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was kind of like you were saying at that end. It's, it's about building a a team of support, right? Like of, of who shares these values with you. Um, I'm a big advocate of community based therapeutic work. I think that for me personally, uh, both in my own life and um, in the life of my clients, a lot of healing comes from community. And I think that for a long time, therapy has been really individualized. And so I'm also very curious about the ways in which people can build community around shared value systems. Because I think a lot of times that isolation uh, uh, supports the problem. Um, and so I'm always curious about how to invite more of a sense of community for my clients on both the local level. So, so you're asking them in that case to identify someone who shares their values? Yeah, yeah. Who would who would you share this photograph with, right? Who would you be able to share these values with uh, that we talked about? Yeah. I mean, that's sort of what NAMI does. It's a community. It's yeah. a community of people with similar situation, but the relative they love who has a mental health condition. Mm -hmm. And we talk and share and teach and bond and attack and they and it releases guilt and shame right. when they're not isolated and they're together because there's so many with similar struggles with someone with a mental health condition so i really think you're right power of community is so important to to help the healing absolutely. i love that absolutely thank you Sharon, I was just about to say the same thing. It just seemed very much in alignment when you were saying about community and who else you can talk to and who else is on your team. And it's so much of what we do here at NAMI is, you know, language matters. That was another big point that you that you said in your presentation, John, and really kind of identifying that language and creating a vocabulary that your family or your trusted members of your team can use to communicate and and kind of journey on that path together. Um, I had a question for you, um, and I just think it's so fascinating. I, I, I saw, you know, the, the same thing, that last slide was with the photograph. In my mind, I went back to that movie, Back to the Future. I don't know if anyone, if anyone else remembers yeah. that film, yeah, but they had that picture, that. right? He had that picture and it was his family and it was disappearing and then reappearing. And I just thought, oh gosh, it was such, and again, such a metaphor about who, who you care for and you holding on to it. And that was such a positive image. I'm wondering with photo uh, narrative therapy in this age of social media and with the recent whistleblower with Facebook and all of the data that's coming out about, you know, images and how they can be detrimental, especially to our youth, um, how uh, as a therapist, a photo narrative therapist, how are you navigating that and, and helping or have you had any um, experience with that about the negative effects of, of photos and and how the, how can you navigate around that that's a great question and I'm glad you asked it because there's a whole part of my workshop that I dedicate to social media uh, and so uh, I'll just kind of keep it as brief as I can but uh, one way in which I do that is well first let me lead with saying that I feel as though like um, like solutions, problems are also multi-story, right? And so I think that as well, uh, you know, social media having this detrimental effect, it's actually, it's also in addition had some really positive effects within mental health systems. For people within the LGBTQ community um, who live in the middle of this country who don't have those accesses to community that we're talking about, hashtags and things like trans youth speaks or Tumblr were really a way of kids being able to connect uh, throughout the internet, right? So I think there have been some very healing things that have come from social media, but uh, also 
of course, some very, very um, problem saturated uh, issues that come up in my practice all the time. And one way that I've dealt with it is that I work with a lot of, uh, of people who are in their um, 20s and 30s, mostly, right? And Instagram is a very big thing. And so uh, I would say a, a lot of our conversations are about social media. And I've often invited clients to go through their Instagram feed together, right? And to talk about, okay, with this picture right now, what sorts of messages are you getting about yourself from this image, right? And also using that as a rich opportunity to try on some of the narrative frameworks of externalizing those problems, right? Of deconstructing those shoulds that I talked about in the beginning of, of, the, um, of, the, of the presentation, a rich opportunity to deconstruct some of those shoulds of what one should look like or should be, right? Or what does success look like? What, you know, and allowing people to take their own evaluative stance against that from an outside perspective. So I have gone through social media content with my clients and done a very in the moment, very present minded uh, exercises around the idea of deconstructing those images and the effects and messages and narratives that they, they tell themselves about themselves based on those photographs. And I think that that's really important, um, especially because these things aren't going anywhere. They are only going to get kind of more pervasive uh, within our cultural context. So I think it's really important as mental health practitioners and therapists that we begin to engage with that material and to not be afraid to engage with that material. Um, was that helpful? Did that answer some of your questions? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I love that collaborative approach about actually I, sitting and talking about it and identifying it and sharing how you feel uh, and really looking at it because it's it's um, necessary, I think. So that's fantastic. Thank you. And I love your idea about opening up the DSM-5 and having your clients read a description of yep. some diagnosis and say, do you think this applies to you or it doesn't? I yeah. have a brilliant idea. Why haven't I thought of that? Listen, I don't have it in my practice. I don't, there's no smoky mirrors here. You yeah, know, I, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I take notes. I'm a big avid note taker. I take a ton of notes. I tell my clients, you're welcome. I'll photocopy these notes right now for you. You want to take them out the door They're for you because they're all my clients language. They're ne there's nothing on it. I'm literally writing down their language to be able to use as touchstones to to talk yes, about. to be able to feed it back to them and know that yeah. help them understand that you're really getting them. Yeah. Yeah. So you John, know, I think it's okay if you steal this from from John. I think he would be honored. Oh, from, take from, from it! Him. I I stole it. <laughs> is it we, right? we, yeah, we, we can do this with someone who is diagnosed with bipolar disorder or borderline personality disorder. Let them kind of look at the definition in DSM five. Do you think this relates to you? It doesn't relate to you? I mean, I'm working with a narcissist right now. This couple, the guy's a flaming narcissist. You know, and I'd like to open up, the, and he's brilliant. I'd like to open up the DSM-5 and have him read the description and ask, does this apply to you? You think? Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. What do you think? He's a narcissist. Of course it applies to him. Everything well, applies to him. You know, so anyway, it's just a brilliant idea. What do you he's imagine? Collaborative. What do you imagine they might say if they read it? Yeah, what do you think he might you might say if he read? I think he would agree with. It. I think he would be shocked and really embrace it. Yeah, because he knows he's got the problems. Yeah, yeah, I think he'd really embrace it. Unlike Trump, who could never <laughs> embrace it. You know, I knew that was coming. I knew it was coming. <laughs> Sorry, I hope no one's a Trumpette in this audience. You know. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I definitely am. So, no, I'm just kidding. Sorry, that was a joke. That was a joke. <laughs> yes, I think it landed. In this audience, it landed, John. Okay. <laughs> so, any other questions anybody has for John? Yeah, Cynthia. You're on mute, Cynthia. 
Cynthia, yes, you're on mute. We can't hear you. Okay, if you're talking about the woman that was at very depressed, her whole life she's been depressed. Yeah. And you showed her the photograph. Look, she's at a wedding. And look, you're dancing. How is that perceived by her? So, yeah, so um, I, I share that story not as like, oh, look, I'm a, I'm a miracle worker here with the no, photographs. No. Because yeah. I can't say... I can't say that that immediately changed things, but what it did was it opened up a small, very small opening in the storyline, a very small opening to return to, right? Uh, what did she say to that? She was surprised. Uh, at her affect changed like very dramatically for the first time in our sessions. Like it, the okay. affect, was very just all of a sudden like like uh, it was almost like a little bit of an aha going on um and so i think it it allowed space to kind of step outside of that problematic problematic narrative that had recruited her for so long that was wonderful and even if it was just for that moment right even if it was just for that moment i think that it's a hundred percent worth explore yes. right uh so um yeah that was a really powerful moment um thank you yeah no problem um the question yeah, yeah garrett um i think you mentioned earlier <clears throat> that um there's no change that's too small yeah mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about that please yeah absolutely so I think a lot of times, um, specifically within uh, American culture, we can get recruited into the idea that we have to make huge changes very quickly, uh, or that we need to achieve a lot very quickly. Uh, our culture has a big problem with moving slowly in general, right? And so for me, uh, I mean, the simple fact that someone comes to therapy and, and walks through that door and sits in the room is already a huge moment of change, right? That's already a huge moment, right? So I really like to help highlight and honor those things for my clients that can get caught up within the fast paced mentality of the idea that we need to change this right now and that I'm going to change these things very quickly. And I'll say that these don't, these ideas don't own, only recruit my clients. They recruit me as a therapist. I mean, I'm always reminding myself that like, whoa, wait a second. Change happens slowly over time, right? And I always need to remind myself that because I get recruited into that discourse as well that is in the very air that I breathe, right? Um, of problem solving and trying to solve things right away. So. I really try to remind myself and my clients that change happens slowly. And, and yeah, there's no too small of a goal or an exception, right? Moment of change. Showing up consistently to therapy, that's huge. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, um, I'm going to put my email in the chat right now. If anyone would like uh, any of the documents, feel free to email me. And um, I hope this was, I know I, you know, there's not that much time. So I tried to really give a lot in the brief amount of time, um, but I am totally open to sharing more and remaining in contact. And uh, so, yeah, feel free to reach out to me. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, John. This was amazing. Um, and, you know, thank you to Janice Black Warner. This is her speaker series that we're able to have these amazing guests come to to present in front of our community once a month and really offer so much information and a different point of view. And I mean, it was just wonderful to have your creative spirit. So th thank you. For thank you, too. You have a real kind of different soft collaborative twists 
on being a therapist. And it's wonderful to hear young therapists like yourself are working in this way. Thank you so much, John. Yeah, thank you. And I'm curious to know how it goes with that, you know, the person who's struggling with a relationship to narcissism. Okay. Well, uh, uh, call me. You know, call me. <laughs> right. He's not a narcissist. He's having a relationship <laughs> with narcissism. Um, um, yeah. I'm curious, though. I, I am curious about the opening of the DSM, and I think that that is, is a very important. Um, That's so, so interesting. You know, let's, why not? You know, so people get diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and they feel relief because they have a set of symptoms. Sure. They can now work with, and they feel relieved to have finally understand what's going on. So it's it's interesting. You really offered a different perspective. Thank you so much, John. Thank, thank you, you for having me. I, it was an yes. honor. Yes, John. Thank you. And and maybe I know you mentioned something about a workshop. So maybe sometime yeah. in the future we could, you know, talk about doing a workshop for our community. You know, that that might be something really cool just to offer a different a different lens in a very creative way. So um so thank you yes. again. Thank you. And I just want all of you to know our next speaker meeting is the first uh, Wednesday in December, which is December. Is it December 6th also? It's November, isn't it? November. Oh, yeah, I meant November. Yes, November. And so we have a speaker for November uh, and we will have a speaker for December too. So uh, thank you, Sharon. Yes. So we, we, we will end. Uh, let's see. Who is our speaker for November? I believe it's, it's Rabbi Gudzik from Nicole Gudzik, Rabbi Nicole Gudzik from the Sinai Temple. And I believe she's going to be speaking on how to cope with the holiday season. Yes, and yes, yes, that's who our speaker is. And, and Nami also has a lot of information about dealing with the holidays with individuals who have mood swings and a kind of uh, can sometimes be somewhat disruptive and how to be collaborative with them and have them play a role in the holiday and be part of it. So thank you so much, John. And we'll see all thank of you. All. I really appreciate you having me. Thank you. You're so welcome. We, we will hope touch bases again. All and right. You, you talk with us thank again. You. We would love that. Thank you so right. much. And thank right, you everybody. all of you for joining our meeting tonight. And we thank apologize you. that not everyone got the